So it got off to a, an interesting start. Um, 2.30 on uh, Saturday night when we were, uh, I was underneath the reception room with a, a blow heater in my hand, feverishly attacking this pipe full of ice trying to make the solid heating system go. And uh, finally I heard David up above saying, oh, it's, something's moving, something's moving. And the feeling that after <coughs> working 10 hours straight to try to get this thing going for the, for the third day in a row that it was finally going, I felt this must be what it feels like to, to uh, be a, or it must be something like what it feels like to be a fighter pilot that takes off from one of these aircraft carriers in the Gulf for the mission to go bomb Baghdad and to, to go and get there and drop your bombs and come back and, and land unscathed. And how uh, absorbing the, the condition the world is when you know, the, the idea of having just narrowing your mind down to we're just going to uh, get this heating system going it's for for ten hours you can easily think of little else and how uh, your world becomes this <coughs> this project. Now, most people know that that, uh, uh, but we all get caught up in in this kind of activity. And if anyone, I'm probably uh, one of the most uh, chronically caught up in the conditioned world of Amaravati and looking after it. Now. Um, Certainly, it's something that I find in retreats is is a very helpful time to actually look at some of the the patterns in this uh, web of, of absorbing into activity and absorbing into very interesting ideas. And, uh, I don't know what other people find, but it. <coughs> the first part of the, the retreat, I find my mind trying to just settle down and the, the tendency is to, to keep picking up uh, interesting ideas of commenting on what's happening in the sala or thinking about what we're going to do after the retreat. And, uh, it's, it's quite easy to let a thought become a, a, a half hour's proliferation about, about something quite interesting. <clears throat> and just to, on a retreat, I find the mind uh, quieting down so that one catches and observes these patterns more at their inception and seeing that there is actually quite a lot of choice to, to, to pick these things up. There's quite a lot of volition involved in that. And to, to find the mind putting a lot more effort into uh, just watching w w what is the, the condition we're absorbed into now and just <coughs> not trying to, to get too deep into samadhi or into a space where conditions are just obliterated and you're just holding on to something very peaceful like the breath but, but really trying to gather my attention around the, the condition that is and you know for me there's a lot of karma made with with work and creating projects and thinking about things and I, what I find is is most helpful is to actually when my mind is doing that to just <coughs> steady my attention right on that that mode because that's the one I have the least objectivity of. It's not 
needing to just go to someplace peaceful, it's needing to create peace around that very uh, creative conditioning that habitually just uh, draws my attention in so that I'm not very reflective and it's, I found it uh, important to learn how to, to to create a sense of ease around the, the, the very kind of intense absorption that gathers around a, an idea or a, a project or some creation and because really most of them you can take them or leave them it's not important whether we uh, you know, the, the the actual uh, idea of any one of these creations whether it's what are we going to do with the roofs or what are when are we going to get alternative energy schemes or what about insulating the, the tree center kitchen or you know these things, whether we do them or not, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. But the, what does make a, a difference is the degree of intensity that the mind creates around, the degree of importance the mind creates around these things. And I see it, it's, it, it is important if you are involved in ideas with, it's important to <coughs> pay attention to the passion that's that our minds create around it. And that's, for me, just, just bringing, one's, bringing my attention to just the intensity of, of emotion that's present with, with that idea, with that uh, uh, creation. Last year I was People often wonder, well, where do I get so much energy from? And uh, I was really thinking about this a lot because I find I do have quite a lot of energy. But uh, I realize that quite a lot of the energy comes from uh, bawa tanha, which is the the craving to to create things, craving to make things happen in the future. Just a lot of energy in that all the time. And it's... Uh, I mean, I've watched sometimes when I come back to my room after the, the puja, particularly during the year, and I could, <coughs> if I really put my will towards it, even though I might be quite tired, if I wanted to, if there was a project that needed thinking about, I could easily say it till one or two o'clock, just steaming and stewing away in my mind about it. Because that's the energy of Bawatana. It's very absorbent and very powerful. And yet there's there's not a lot of reflection going on uh, in terms of peaceful reflection or in terms of turning the, the mind towards that which isn't bound and isn't attached to this particular creation. And, on a, in a retreat setting, you have, I find, the, the opportunity to, to watch more discreetly how the mind can go narrow into one idea or thought or feeling, and how it can, how when you turn your attention to that and, and really meditate on it, contemplate that, that feeling, then the mind is drawing back from it. It's not just a solely identified with it, but the mind can actually see the space around the condition that actually f frames it. It's like when <coughs> you see a cup here, we know this is a cup be partially because of the space around it. And in the, in the same way, when, the, when we contemplate a, a, a condition of the mind, then we're softening the attention so you begin to see the, the peaceful space around it. And that I've, I find, we, you know, it's just a matter of training the mind to, to activate that reflex, to not just hold, but to also to 
to soften the, the holding so that we see that that which is more restful amidst the 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 condition. The uh, <coughs> the uh, what I often find with the, this habitual interest in in the conditions and the, the habit of bawa tanha taking over the mind is that usually the the result of it is is dullness that the the fascination with bawa tanha ends in in dullness and this is. Uh, Something I found I I worked a, a lot with trying to learn to to get more clarity on the amidst dullness because the, when you get so habitually fascinated with the, with conditions when that energy is is gone then the mind feels lacking in energy and it's it's uh, it's equally difficult to bring energy to to dullness because often for me dullness is 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 just bawatanha without much juice it's the same activity is going on when I'm dull is when I'm full of energy, it's just going on with, without much kind of <coughs> conscious direction. It's more kind of subconscious meanderings of the mind, whereas when you're kind of fully into something of great interest, there's quite a lot of energy into it, where you've got a lot invested in it. When you're, if you're a bit tired, you don't have the energy to kind of direct your mind around, and so it just goes in a more dreamy way. And, and you notice, you can you look around and you you can you can feel yourself, your own body just not being very still. And the body just starts to to weave and meander along with the mind. And and it's it's very much the same uh, condition of Bhavatana I find just in a in a different mode. It doesn't have the conscious uh, juice behind it. It's got this uh, subconscious forces just going going around in the same mode, and that's uh, emotionally not as as pleasing a condition because it's uh, you know if you kind of wake up to it and you find you just kind of keeled over and about to hit the floor, you kind of you feel this. <laughs> sense that, gosh, I wonder what the people behind me think I'm doing, but, and that's not, uh, there. there he goes again. <laughs> <laughs> but to actually learn to, to bring, to, to wake the mind up to, to dullness means, what I, what I find it means is to 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 wake up to the the patterning in the in the mind that's that's constantly taking over this habit of of just meandering to and to the most helpful thing I found is to bring the attention to the the dull feeling and so then you're you're waking up to 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 in in the face of dullness you're beginning to see the because the 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 condition itself is you know has a an emotional tone, but the, the the awakened mind, when you actually focus on the condition, has has a different tone, the, the peaceful mind. And so, when you when you turn your mind to a condition of of dullness, it's if you're you know it, it's uh, you can in the same way to turn your mind to any condition, you can you can get a perspective on it. You can begin to see that which isn't just completely absorbed in the, that feeling. And usually, for me, the, 
the content of the the the, uh, the where my mind is the the story the dream that I'm caught up in is really not that important to, I don't find it really gets me very far to try to just focus on that but more to focus on the the, the feeling of of the, the emotional tone, something a bit uh, subtler or deeper. The, the actual story of it is a much more intellectually head-centered phenomenon. Usually if I focus on my head, the head is a bit top-heavy and I just fall over. But if, if I try to turn the attention down more to some, find some feeling to, to hook onto, the, then contemplating that, that sometimes <coughs> I find I can can wake myself up. But if I try to just meditate on on where what it is I'm I'm thinking about at four in the morning, usually at four fifteen I'm back asleep in the in the dream of it again. <coughs> Did you? find like looking at the cause is the sense of having to do something? Did well that's what's underneath it. And you know, when 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 I can get down to that, mm. that then the, the mind is actually uh, somehow under the the actual story. And that's where there's there's a quite a, a different kind of energy. It's not the energy of creation, it's the energy of, of stillness. Balance. No, it's energy. <coughs> There's a power done that's always there. You know, like that's what so many of you meditate with is Bhava Dunha, and the desire to get something. Mm -hmm become something. That's why that until you really uh, let go of that, then you're not you're still caught in the you won't see you won't uh, realize the cessation of suffering. Like the why the retreat groupie or the retreat uh, addicts and the people that that really uh, you know go at meditation with that with that bhava dunha. I mean, we all start with that. I certainly did. <laughs> you know, the desire to get, to become something that helps. But then, and then, oftentimes the meditation techniques and teachers even talk in a bhavadana way. You've got to get rid of these defilements and become a sotapanna. Something like the whole way of talking is is uh, is bhavadana oriented. Remember the sister Rojana, the, the first one? She <coughs> was a classic Bawadana addict. <coughs> she'd run around all day and then as soon as she sat down she'd, she'd fall over. <coughs> it's kind of because the mind was just so caught in the in the plans and ideas. I've got to do something, and I've got to get my practice together, and I've got to get rid of things and get hold of something else. That's why you know you will see that. With Buddha Dhamma, you're starting, even the beginning has to be, even from the very beginning, it, 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 you need to get 
on the right track. <laughs> Otherwise, you, you go off in the, to the wrong place. <laughs> End up in Swansea rather than anywhere else. <laughs> That's where the like the reflective, uh, reflective meditations are so and then investigated. Dhamma. So you really like to, you know Bhavadana. You just know all its subtleties and ins and outs. You study it. You know, it's trying to get take a stand against it, like trying to get rid of it. But, Really, you, your reflection is very good. In fact, I don't want to pay more. Really, studies, investigates Bhavadana. That's what, what, if that's what he's experiencing, that's the the thing that tends to easily delude us. Then, then we uh, investigate it, not just try to get rid of it, you know, like she's trying to sit there in the morning meditation just with a view that <clears throat> you don't want to fall asleep and, and, and bob up and down because it's embarrassing. And then and it's all self, isn't it? It's all, I don't want to be someone who who falls over in the meditation. And I don't, I want to become somebody who sits straight during the meditation. I want to get rid of <coughs> Bawa Dunha because Ajahn Sumedho said that's the cause. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, and, uh, I mean, those things do, you know, are, uh, we have experience the desire that, you know, to, I mean, nobody wants to fall asleep in the morning meditation. I'm sure none of you come there to fall asleep or to bounce up and down like some of you do, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, this is, you know, with investigation of Dhamma, of, of desire, that's why that I've tried to put so much emphasis on this, this I've got to do something, because retreat time is, is a Gives that impression is a real, a real uh, catalyst to the Bawa Dunha problem, isn't it? Two months retreat, I've got to do something. Almost two months retreat, and then I've got to do something. Follows immediately. I've got to get my practice together. I've got to get the most out of this retreat, or or everything. Oh, another winter's retreat, hard slog. And uh, kind of thinking of it as being a, an ordeal. Right, developing there. You know, they're, they're, then you, then people read the suttas and they think I've got to develop the jhanas. That's another bhavadana. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you think what's well, in the sutta? The Buddha said, develop the jhanas. You know, that, but then we can take what the Buddha says and make it into Bhava Dhanha, isn't it? Okay. Doesn't be because the Buddha says it, doesn't mean that, I mean, remember, it's only convention, and we can take conventions and use them uh, in a totally wrong way. I don't know why people want the jhanas, actually. I don't understand it. 
because it's so conditioned and so unnecessary to, to think in those terms. When you got the Four Noble Truths, who wants the jhanas? <laughs> but then the desire mind wants the jhanas, doesn't it? Your bhavadana mind wants to get refinement, wants happiness, wants wants to suppress everything, doesn't want to have to look at things, doesn't want to have to bear with, endure, wants to get into kind of pleasant states that you can maintain for a long time, or have a sense of achievement or attainment. So, that, uh, and recognize that, that uh, our minds are highly conditioned <coughs> to think in those terms. It's, the Western mind is a, it doesn't have the sada, the faith, the trust. <laughs> it just wants to be, can't get something. You know, I want to buy, if you could buy the jhanas, you'd do it. If you could purchase jhanas at the Selfridges, Herod's, <clears throat> you'd go and buy them. You can just see that, like in the investigation of Dhamma, uh, even the things like understanding dukkha. Don't think of understanding in in the way your mind thinks of understanding. It's uh, barinya. Barinya means still doesn't mean to to kind of know about something or have you know, have a kind of definition, think you understand it because you have a, a definition or a, a intellectual grasp of the idea. But it's, uh, it's really like in the standing under or really knowing something. This is, this having looked at something very closely, having fully uh, accepted and looked at something that's suffering, then you, you say there is an understanding of suffering. It's not just, oh yeah, I understand suffering, yes. As a, as a kind of, of uh, aside, or because you think you understand. That's why the, the, we, we think you know, the conceit of modern Western people, I mean, we think we, we know so much because we know a lot about it. A lot of things. We think we have. We think we because we, we have university degrees and we have uh, we've we've read a lot, studied a lot, so we think we know a lot. We think we're well educated and we're very intelligent. And the kind of conceit that comes from 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 our society, but we don't. We, we lack depth in understanding, don't we? Most of, I realize most of my university training was, was very superficial. Most forgot most of it, 99% of it, once I left. All those core exams I used to cram for and everything. <laughs> but then, but nothing was learned profoundly or very little was, little rubs off now and then, but with the Four Noble Truths is a profound investigation. And profundity doesn't lie in, in vocabulary or in, uh, in a kind of complexity, but in, in getting to the very root, the source, the, the basic pattern, the way it is. <coughs> Because a lot of you think you, you understand your own suffering because you think, ah, oh, yes, uh, well, you see, I have this nervous complaint because uh, my father used to beat me up when I was a child. That's what I understand. I, I feel this sense of 
rejection because daddy used to hit me, punch me in the nose and black my eyes out, broke my jaw when I was three years old. So ever since then, you see, I've had this problem. I've never, never been able to really trust uh, authority figures. When I see Ajahn Sumedho, I think I get this kind of panic. I think he's going to break my jaw. <coughs> Very profound understanding, indeed. <laughs> and that's just on the. That's just. Uh, uh, that's not that's not very profound. Maybe it helps a little bit to analyze things. But we're looking at much something much more real and just uh, incidences of our lives, just basic existential fears and. And the forces that affect our just everything, the attraction, repulsion, the whole, the whole thing of, of our human karma, we're, we're looking at, understanding, investigating, it, not just, why do I, why do, why am I, why do I have these neurotic hang-ups as a personality? And that's not, that's not the dukkha, it's a super, super, superficial kind of analysis. A psychological analysis. When you, when you're born, you you get born into a family, and and the parents are the way they are. They can be saints or demons or combinations. It's just a result of birth. There's no guarantee we're going to get good parents and and benevolent situations and and. Uh, we're going, to, we're going to be treated fairly, and life is going to be uh, like it should be. So, birth means that you're born into you know, the risk of being born. But you can, you see, what, what is born dies, and so you're going to the very basic pattern and uh, a profound understanding of how things really are. People say, why, why do people uh, get cancer or AIDS or these kind of diseases? Why do I have these diseases? Because you're born. Being born means we're subjected to the whole range of pleasure and pain, good fortune and bad fortune. Now that doesn't, might not sound like a real, that might sound like kind of uh, dismissing thing. But actually, that if you really contemplate that, you know what that really means. That that, that then you begin to uh, not take your life and your problems and yourself so think that's so terribly important and and may, and endlessly kind of wall, wallow in your own feelings and neurotic fears and so on. You know, because it's not really important anymore. Your personality and the things that have been done to you and, and all that are not, are not the, not so, they're not so, uh, they don't have the gravity and the, they're not everything for you. You can have a perspective on them. Like the, that being born, then I'm subjected to, to uh, like, say, the, the, the way my parents are. The wisdom and the, the kind of qualities, good and bad, that they have. Should I blame them for it? Should I hate them because they're not uh, what they should be according to an ideal mother and father? Or is this just life? This is what we learn from. This is our karma. This is what we have to learn from. This is this is the grist for the mill, and uh, this is and this is what we take. We learn from it, like in the night <coughs> of Tiberia. You 
you learn from it. If you if you don't learn from life, then you then you get stuck. You get going to be stuck in a realm. So there's nothing nothing uh, that can happen to us that prevents us from from realization of truth. If you've been sexually abused or mistreated or unloved or rejected or raped or or uh, tortured or or maybe none of these things. Maybe it's just the subtleties of uh, of just um, being born into a family that that what that way your parents were Dharahans. My father was always away and uh, working, and I never never had a chance to to really develop my identity with my father and, uh, and go on like that. There's, there's certain value in, in, in that, in one respect, but to wallow in that is, is, is a waste of your life. One's father goes away or disappears or is busy or gets killed in a war or whatever, then that's life. We, we keep going. We, we keep investigating suffering and, uh, and understanding it, letting go. Being sexually abused is not an obstacle to enlightenment. But being attached to the idea that I've been sexually abused is an obstacle. <laughs> That's where you get the clarity of seeing and the and the faith in the path because <clears throat> when you're attached to these I've been ruined by life because of this this happened to me and <clears throat> that whole assumption of me uh, and my life has been ruined if you don't uh, if you don't uh, if you believe it and operate from that perspective, then you're always going to be like that. You're going, going to be someone who's, uh, who can't make it. This is where the, we just, we keep in, uh, in uh, the ability to reflect on life, we forgive everyone because we, we, we suddenly feel that it's, it's life. Life is like this. It always has been. You read the Greek myths. Zeus was always going around raping every nymph he could do <coughs> his mangy hands upon. His wife Hera was always in a state of despair scheming how to stop God from raping the nymphs. <laughs> well, that's not justification for any of us. <laughs> but it is, it is uh, archetype mythology, isn't it? It's about this, the, the gods and the humans and the relationships between men and women and the, the forces of men, the warrior types and the goddesses, the the uh, Athena, which is a is a warrior goddess, and, and Venus, and all these others, they're they're, you know, we can look at them as just fairy tales, or they are the, definitely the products of the human heart and human experience. And like the war, it shouldn't be, which, on an ideal level, uh, but then. <coughs> In mythology, there's always been wars going on. In the Buddhist cosmology, the devas and the asuras are the asuras are always trying to to attack the deva realms, the heavenly realms, the jealous gods trying to to uh, 
I always wanted waging war, waging war and killing, trying to destroy something above you, something better than you are. Or the warrior that's trying to uh, destroy the kill the dragon and the and the uh, you know fight off the evil forces. These are these are the uh, archetype archetypes for humanity, and so that humanity is like this. It's not, we're not we're not basically good. And life isn't an ideal, life is this way. Uh, so that the, the aim is to, and the reason why, uh, you know, that we're experiencing all this is because we've been born. Being born into a human form, what, what can I expect? I got born into this body, I have, to, I have to live with it till it dies and whatever happens to it. How do I know that the rest of my life is just going to be a bed of roses or a bowl of cherries or a bowl of roses or a bed of cherries <laughs> my sister always confuses her metaphors That isn't fair that Mother Nature should send a snowstorm down and freeze the pipes during this winter's retreat. It's not fair. It shouldn't happen. We should have a retreat where none of these things happen, when, where nobody goes kooky and, and everybody uh, gets enlightened and where Nothing is to we we not we not our practice is not interfered with or interrupted in any way, is how it should be. But then, life is this way. And so unexpected things happen, and uh, it's the realm of contingencies <coughs> that we live in. So that say we, life is this way. And then, with, uh, say, with, with what's happened to us in the past, as long as you learn from it, it's no, it needn't be an obstacle, you know, no matter how awful or horrible or unfair it was. If you, if you don't learn from it and accept it and come to terms with it and let go of it, then it's always going to be there, it's going to be, you're going to be stuck in a place where you're going to have to be reborn again and again until you do come to terms with it. I guarantee it. You, there's no escaping your karma. You've got to, you have to recognize and come to grips with, with the karma we have. So it's not just by trying to ignore or bypass things, we get stuck. And then we have, we'll always be saying this idea of rebirth, we'll always be reborn until we work it out, till we get it right. So now this is the best, best opportunity to get it right, isn't it? You've got, what, what better situation can you have than a Four Noble Truths and all the things, the kind of conventions that are kind of saying, wake up and keep going and You've got everything helping you to do it. It's a, it's a rare opportunity. You know, most most people don't have much help with it, with seeing things in the right way. Like so much of it, you hear the therapies and the, all the kind of things that go on now, and the attempt to self-knowledge, and but it's all based on uh, kind of assumptions of a permanent ego and a 
personality. So you, one's always, in the end, after going through catharsis and analyses and the whole range of therapies, you end up with still this, with this basic idea that you're somebody who has to do something. Or maybe you think you're somebody that doesn't have to do anything, but you still think you're somebody. <laughs> so, <laughs> being, uh, if you penetrate, if you if you can really see that, and that's where like second noble truth is spelled out very clearly: gama dana, bhava dana, vipo dana. The three desires. And uh, if you if you investigate, like when Dr. Pembo was saying, it's very to really see that if he starts thinking, oh, I've got this problem of falling asleep and going dull in the morning, chair, I've got to get rid of it, and uh, and then it starts just operating from, I've got to get rid of it. Uh, I don't want to look bad in the meditation hall, or I've got to set an example, or uh, this whole sense of I've got something, uh, I shouldn't, I don't want this, I want to get rid of it. Tell me how I can get rid of it as quickly as possible. Uh, is uh, is uh, if, he, if he believes that, then he's always going to be reborn in that state. He's going to keep doing it. <coughs> because your willpower will not get you out of it. Even if you succeed and just through will, you, you, if you don't investigate Dhamma and don't see the, the cause, the real cause, then as soon as your as soon as your will uh, kind of packs up, you're you're even worse than before. That's what I was saying yesterday about Jitanu Pasana, where you you're looking at the just that feeling, that mood of of wanting to get rid of something, or feeling threatened, or fear. There's vague moods of the mind to be able to to objectify it. And so then you're outside the conditioned realm because there there's a awareness. Mindfulness is the path to the deathless. There's a book called that Mindfulness Path. <laughs> 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 Appamado Matapadan and the in uh, that when when there's mindfulness when there's Appamado uh, which is non not being heedless not being deluded Appamado being awake and attentive and then there is the Amatapadan, the immortal way. Amata is the immortal, padang is pa. Apamado amatapadan. But if there's me trying to to uh, get rid of dullness, then there's then there's uh, what is the next? Pamado machuno padang. Pamado is is uh, heedlessness is the way to the to death. Pamado machuno padang padang is path and machuno is death path to death. It, as long as there's there's uh, pamado or heedlessness, then there's then there's going to be death. A sense of fear, fear is a kind of Inner, inner dying. We're dying all the time. We're on this path of death. And so there's always this fear and anxiety and worry are the result. It's, they're all kind of mental deaths, emotional deaths. This, this anxiety and, and negativity that, that uh, invade our heart. Is the, is the is the realm of death? We're we're living in the death realm with with the uh, with the prince of death. 
when, when, when there's mindfulness, apamado, not being heedless, then there is the amatapada. When I try to try whenever I like do formal practice immediately to reflect on on that on the, what am I do, do, am I here do I have a feeling that I have to do something do I do I, have to, do I what is it like do, do I feel that I have to spread peace to the Gulf do I feel I have to develop Anapanasati do I do I'm, I'm sitting now do I should I get get rid of dullness? This 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 kind of feeling that I'm I'm here now and I've got to do something. I try to remember and to look at that so that it doesn't it isn't the cause of my meditation. It isn't the it isn't the uh, the uh, cause that uh, takes me to Soka Parite or Tuka Tomana. Then to to keep thinking of developing of, of just practicing with the with the body you have the body's here and now it's dhamma isn't it the body is the dhamma it's here it's now it feels like this there's the four postures sitting standing walking lying down there's the breath anapanasati inhalation exhalation there's the sound of silence there's the feeling there's consciousness. It's like this. There's Dhamma. There's Buddha seeing the Dhamma. Well, if you think, I should meditate on the Dhamma, then, then, then that is. Uh, but that, it's not like you have to do something with it. It's uh, to 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 really acknowledge what's here and now is all you have to do. This is the way it is. It's like this. You're not having to do anything about it. You don't have to make it into something else or or criticize it or hold on to it. You're just acknowledging that that this moment is this way. The reflective mind we can the postures like this. It feels this way. We can experiment with postures so we know what it feels like to sit straight. Or what it feels like to sit crooked. Which is the best feeling? Crooked or straight? For you to find out. The straight is the best. If the Arjun Samedo said, sit straight, and then you, you, you're doing it because I'm telling you to. And there, you know, there's no Buddha reflecting on Dhamma in that, you're just obeying me. Afraid I might, you know, criticize you for sitting, not sitting straight. That's still childish, isn't it? So you, you you can observe that, that wanting to please, wanting to, the, as the Gama Dana, Bhava Dana, Vipuva Dana. So even these desires and emotional hang ups and problems and dead ends are, can be seen as Dhammas. They're, they're part of the path, they're the path for us. It's the path is here and now. So, what, you know, no matter how personal the, the condition might be, you know, we're not talking about the path as a kind of, of uh, we're not describing it as a, as a, as that it's, that in its qualities, in quantities, it's the same for everyone. I mean, even though we, we all are here and now, aren't we? Is anyone not here and now? And is everyone breathing? And is everyone, uh, everyone sitting? Sitting. Everyone is uh, conscious. Anyone not conscious? Raise your hand. And you, <laughs> and everyone's feeling. Is feeling. But what you're conscious of and what you're feeling is, is from where you are. I mean, it's not. You're going to feel exactly what I'm feeling. We're not not saying that you have to feel what I feel, but 
we're, co- we're, we're recognizing on the reflection of the Dhamma that there's feeling, we, so this is the common ground that we all have. But then how it manifests in its qualities is infinitely variable. So I mean, you might be feeling uh, despairing and hopeless and somebody else be feeling fully inspired and and uh, perfectly calm and peaceful and then you might want to run away and another person <coughs> might want to, to dedicate his whole life to the Dhamma and be a monk or a nun till they die at this moment. These, <laughs> these things, these are the, the qualities, those are qualities, those are not Dhammas. The dhammas are the fact that thoughts and feelings are arise and cease. And these are, it's, it's always this getting outside, not, not being dazzled or repelled by the quality of the conditioned realm. Not being absorbed and, or, but recognizing that conditioned realm is this way. That's why it's called transcendence, because you're, you're getting outside the conditioned realm through mindfulness, through at that moment when there's mindfulness. You're, you're not in the mortal realm anymore. You're not, you're not caught in the, in the delusion and the uh, <coughs> assumptions uh, that the conditioned realm uh, give to us. So in the, the peace vigil, is the peacefulness or using peace as a as a as a theme, but not as an attachment. <coughs> it's a reflection, encouraging this to recognize, realize peacefulness, what it is to be peaceful, rather than just go around saying, "Why can't everyone be at peace? <laughs> Why do we have to have war? It's not fair." And uh, realize that peace is is a, when when human beings are at peace, they're they're arahants. And I don't think there's ever been an arahant elected as president of the United States, prime minister of Britain. Abraham Lincoln, maybe. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher thought she was infallible. <coughs> in uh, in uh, this retreat, like really, like traumas and feelings, and that it's always good to bring them into consciousness. Not to wallow, not to kind of, not, wallowing is poor me, this happened to me and it's not fair. But, <coughs> but uh, skillful use, we have to learn, we must learn from what's happened to us, the good and the bad. If we don't learn at this time, we have to learn it some other time. Then so just uh, encourage you to learn it now while you've got everything going for you. You're encouraged to do that. And it's, it's very important to realize, no matter what's happened to you, what you've done, it's no obstacle <coughs> to, to uh, realization of truth. No, this isn't a, a path for, for just the saintly people who, who, who've uh, never done anything wrong, or anything, nothing bad has ever happened to them. Then it would be just, it would be the Deva Loka, maybe. A nice group of lovely kids just with soda water fountains and ice cream mountains. 
But most of us have been through some pretty rough things in life. And so, I mean, it's not, uh, not, it's not partly in one's own fault and partly the, in a lot of it the fault of somebody else, of the society, of, of just ignorance of the society, or parents, or, or spouses, or whatever. Great disappointments, or upheavals, and disasters are part of a human experience. So, so that, that's not an obstacle, none of it is. Enlightenment. The only, they say, the only really severe ones that prevent enlightenment in this life are killing a Buddha, killing a Buddha, and <coughs> killing your mother and father, huh? and an arahant. Spilling the blood of a Buddha. Yeah. Causing a schism in the sun. How many else did David Allen do? <laughs> so just don't spill the blood of a Buddha, kill an Arahant, or go and murder your mother and father. If you haven't done any of those, and there's no, and I'd even say even if you'd done that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even let that stop me. 